So I've been told by um, the fascist bureaucrats at Flexera that I need to make the following disclaimer. Okay. So in the best tradition of compliance and disclaimers, I'll give you plenty of time to read that and digest that before I continue. So good. Everybody's got that? Just in case you haven't, okay, I need to stress, I am not your lawyer, okay, I am also not your programmer, and today's session is going to provide you an introduction to managing open source compliance and vulnerabilities, okay, but only your lawyers effectively can tell you what to do about that. What that means is basically you can sit there, you can switch off, and you can ignore everything I'm going to say in the next 25 minutes in good conscience, okay. So if we go back to the start, okay, um, and we look at coding and where coding is, your application sits, you know, in this big stack of things, okay. In the good old days, you know, when it was mainframe, you had code and it sat somewhere and everybody knew where it was and everybody knew who wrote it and what it did. Then it got a bit more complicated, you know, it was client server, there was some code over here, there was some code over there, but again, pretty much everyone knew what it did and why it was there. And then suddenly we got to this, you know. We've got applications, your applications that are sitting on top of other people's applications in a stack. You've got system libraries, frameworks, drivers, kernels, all sorts of things out there. Okay? Importantly, some of these things you wrote. Yeah? Some of these things people in the OpenStack ecosystem wrote and you're reusing and you're using. Yeah? Some of these things some random person wrote on Git and you've downloaded them or somebody downloaded them and you're using them in your application. Okay? And so what we find... Um, when we go to organizations is typically applications that look something like this, okay? So, you know, and typically this is what we find, yeah? 50% of the code in an application, and it may or may, you know, differs, but on average, 50% is code that that, you know, the organization has written and therefore, in theory, understands why it's there and what it does, okay? Increasingly, 50% of the other code is open source code, okay? The important thing is that if you then ask the development team what that 50% open source code does, and we find this all the time, hand on heart, they can probably only tell you about 2%, okay, of why it's there, what it does, who downloaded it, why they're using it, you know, what version it is, yeah, they just have no idea. And that represents a significant risk to your organization, okay. It puts you at risk of two of the scariest things in the known universe, okay. And they are zombies and lawyers. Okay. So when I asked my kids, how do I represent a zombie? Obviously, their first response was a Minecraft reference, because it's basically crack for kids. I struggled a bit with the lawyers. And then I came up with the same reference. Because I effectively thought, well, OK, you know, they're both feared and loathed in the same measure. And certainly when you get to compliance and IP lawyers, what do they do? Well, they sort of hunt around in packs, basically preying on intellectual property. And intellectual property is basically other people's brains. So I thought, you know, with apologies to any lawyers in the room, you know, didn't make a lot of difference, really. So we're going to talk, first of all, about how to manage the code zombies, okay? And then we're going to come down to the compliance and the lawyers as well, okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define what a code zombie is. Okay, so a code zombie is a piece of open source code, okay, that lives on long after it was technically declared dead. And some of the other terms you may refer to it as, is, you know, as a component with known vulnerabilities, a stale component. But the key point, okay, is in your code base, there are potentially versions of these components that have actually had security vulnerabilities notified, okay, they are known, yeah. There are even, more importantly, patches and fixes available, okay? So there's no reason for you to have these in your code base unpatched, unfixed, and yet in many cases they are in there because people don't understand what that 48%, 50% of open source actually is and what's in there, okay? And that's really a huge risk, yeah? And what you'll find is, you know, there's no reason for this because, you know, these are actually known vulnerabilities with patches, with fixes, okay? They shouldn't be there. And when we talk to people about that, we say, okay, you know, we've got all this open source code, what are you doing, how are you doing it? They say, oh, well, that's all right, because we're doing static analysis. Yeah. What are you doing about vulnerabilities? Oh, we've got FX COP, we've got Fortify, you know, we're scanning, we're, you know, we're, we're fine. That's how we find our vulnerabilities and our, our issues. There are a number of issues with that approach, okay? 
primarily is the types of um, vulnerabilities that you find in open source components and the way open source is linked and has subcomponents, they're not always picked up by those types of tools as a first point. Okay. And often actually how you're licensed for using those types of tools stops you scanning huge libraries anyway, okay? Because they are licensed per block of code or you know, per line of code or something along those lines. So you know, they don't really encourage you to take a holistic view of your entire code base. So already you're focused on particular things and you may be missing certain components. I think the biggest issue, and you know, personally when we talk to people about this, is even if you are using these tools, the sheer number of hits that you get back, there's the huge amount of data you get back, the false positives that you get back when you do scan actually makes them unusable. Because you're just like, well, I thought I was secure. Whoa, what's all this stuff? How do I fix it? What do I do? I was, oh, never mind, I'll do something else. You know, just shove it under the carpet and we'll ignore it sort of thing. So I think that's, that's really the biggest issue with this approach. You know, they're not fit for this particular purpose because they're not designed for this sort of thing. And then also, as I say, they just bring back a lot of stuff that you're not really concerned about, or you need to be concerned about. So we don't always catch the vulnerabilities. And again, if we talk about code zombies, yeah, you are scanning code with known vulnerabilities, yeah, and fixes, and patches, yeah, and approaches, and yet you are wasting effort if you're pointing a static code analysis at this, because those should not either not already be there, or you should be able to resolve them. So it's a waste of effort, it's a duplication of effort. So, whilst I'm saying don't scan, well, I'm not saying don't scan, okay, we need to scan, but you need to scan with a different type of tool, you need to scan with a different approach, and you need to scan, if you like, with a different mindset as well, okay? And really what you need to do is to review those open source components at a much lower level, okay? One, to detect the vulnerabilities, and two, to also comply with any, you know, open source policies that you might have, and that's the, the lawyer side of things, we'll come back to that as well. And then take the output of those reviews, okay, and use them to make those use, don't use decisions, okay? So you might just blanket say, well, you know, this is vulnerable, I'm not going to use it, I'm going to write my own thing, okay? Or drive some internal remediation, okay? You might say, okay, well, I'm going to actually fix the issue and I'm then going to publish that code out, you know, to make that fix available to the wider OpenStack community, open source community. Or I'm going to fix it in some other way. I'm going to use a different version, a newer version that doesn't have the vulnerability. I'm going to apply a patch, yeah? Or worst case, I'm just going to document it as a bug report and, you know, we'll work on it at some point in the future, but at least it's documented, it's audited, it's out there. Everybody knows, you know, what we need to do about it in the future and perhaps we do it in the next release as well. So that, you know, at a very high level takes care of the, the code zombies, the vulnerabilities, okay, which leaves us with a much scary issue about the lawyers, okay. And to discuss how we, you know, how we manage the lawyers and the, the issue of compliance, I'm going to take a step back and we're going to do a little um, open source licensing compliance 101, okay. So open source is commonly confused with free as in no cost software, okay. Now, the main concept around open source is that open source may be free of cost, but it is not free of obligations, yeah? And the way to think of it is free as in speech and not as in beer, okay? And those open source licenses have a list of obligations that you have to meet in order to legally use that open source library, okay, under that license. And in many cases, your compliance and how you become compliant, how you manage compliance, is dependent on how you're using those open source components, okay? Now we'll cover the various different uses and, and how that works in a second. But importantly, a lot of those licenses will have multiple obligations. You will have to do more than one thing. It may be more than just putting a, you know, a reference in the about box in your application or what, you know, whatever it might be, or putting a copyright stamp in there somewhere. Okay, complicated than that. And to continue our you know, open source licensing compliance 101, so why do you even need an open source license? Well, in most cases, source code is explicitly copyright, even if it's not actually marked, okay? So in theory, you have no right to use somebody else's code without permission, okay? And an open source license and even commercial licenses or you know, specifically commercial licenses are ways of giving somebody 
you know, giving you permission to use somebody else's source code, somebody else's IP. Okay? Now, the licensing of that may come from different places. Okay? So if you're a commercial organization, you are providing a license, you are providing control access because you want to make potentially money out of that application, out of your IP, out of that source. In the open source community, you may be making, you know, you may just want attribution. Okay, you might just think, well, I've written this really cool piece of code, but I'd like that to be recognized, and I'd like that to, you know, there'd be a buzz around the community or whatever I'm writing in that, you know, I contributed to that, I wrote that. Or you may have people making, you know, a particular moral or ethical stand, you know, about a particular thing, saying, well, I don't want it for commercial use. You know, I'm making a stand against, you know, big software vendors, big monopolies that have proprietary software that charge a fortune that stop people getting access to it unless they can afford to pay those licenses. Or people making a moral standpoint saying, I don't want this particular piece of code used, you know, for defense projects, you know, military projects, whatever it might be. They may just want some recognition, yeah. There may even be some of this going on, you know, in this um, thing today in this room. So there's the beerware license where you, you know, you just have, well, if you use this piece of code, it'd be really cool if next time you see me at an OpenStack event, buy me a beer, you know. There's that sort of thing going on as well. But again, that's an obligation under a, under a license. And when you actually, you know, you're looking at using code um, from an open source, um, you know, um, location, forge, you know, whatever it might be, like Git, if it doesn't necessarily have a license, that can indicate other issues potentially with that open source code. Because if they have not taken the trouble to work out whether they want to license it, how they want to license it, how it's applicable, then we often find that in some cases that software, those libraries, perhaps play a bit fast and loose in terms of quality, in terms of coding standards, in terms of security vulnerabilities as well, because they haven't thought the whole thing through. They've just thought, you know what, I'm going to push this out there. And therefore, it's not technically open source if you don't actually have a license. Okay? It does become, if you like, free software or something, but it's not, by definition, open source. So what does actually compliance actually look like? Now, you know, it's not as simple as just ticking all those boxes on that list. But these are some of the things, you know, if you use open source components that, you know, you may have to do in order to be compliant, okay? So you might have to provide copyright notices in your documentation, in the about box in your software. You might have to cut and paste the license text, you know, into that for your users as well. In some cases, you may have to make your source code available either to the end users or to the open source community as a whole. Okay? And obviously there are potentially IP commercial issues associated with that as well. If you make changes to the source code, you might have to mark those up. Yeah? You might have to pay for certain components. Whatever you have to do, and it depends on the license, it depends on the usage, you have to do it for every release. You cannot be compliant once, yeah? and that's it. You have to do this every time you release something that uses those components. Okay? And if those components change, or your application change, or the way you distribute the application changes, then you will have to change the way that you meet those obligations. And we're going to talk specifically, obviously, because you know we're in an OpenStack cloud as a service type environment, specifically about that. But the compliance is going to depend on the delivery method. Yeah. So whether that application is just installed on an operating system, or whether it comes installed with an operating system like Linux whether it's client-server, which bit is which. Mobile apps. Now, mobile apps introduce a whole host of issues around app stores and distribution and how that works as well. So that's you know, a particularly thorny part of um, open source components. Web and JavaScript, CSS. Yeah. Even if, for example, you are using those internally for some sort of intranet or extranet or any other sort of net, that can count or may count as distribution of those components, and you may have to meet certain obligations under the terms of how that's licensed, even if it is not actually, if you like, being distributed to an end customer. You know, it's for internal use. Okay. And then there's the difference between, if you like, hosting something as a service, cloud, versus, you know, classic distribution as well, because most open source licenses really only come into effect upon a distribution, which is effectively sharing to an end user as well. Okay. But there are differences, and then we're going to cover the key differences for cloud as a service in a second. Okay. So, traditionally, yeah, 
end users got their software through physical means, yeah? They had CDs, they had DVDs, they installed things, they downloaded things, they had devices shipped to them that had software installed on it or embedded in it, okay? And most classic open source and commercial licenses were written with that in mind, okay? And many open source licenses only then come into effect with that classic distribution. Okay? There are a couple of loopholes, and we'll talk about that in a second. Okay? But effectively, that's what they were set up to control. Yeah? But obviously, as a service, cloud projects, applications are not distributed in that classic way. Yeah? They run on a server. As my kids constantly remind me, sort of thing, cloud is just a fancy name for somebody else's computer. That's fundamentally what it is. Okay. So users are coming to the software instead of the software coming to the user. And that presents a number of issues in terms of interpreting open source licensing. And there are a couple of loopholes that people have taken advantage of. Specifically, if you look at the um, general public license, there is a lot of discussion about whether if you use general public license software in a cloud environment, whether that counts as distribution. Now, there are some people that argue that it does not, and that's the approach they take. There are some people that argue that it does. And what they did was to close that loophole by writing the Afero general public license. Okay? That effectively says, if you are running something in a cloud environment, in an as-a-service type environment, it counts as classic distribution. And the most important thing about that license is, one of the obligations is that you have to enable this or make available the source code for that entire application to the public as a whole. Which, if you have spent a lot of time developing IP, yeah, and some clever stuff in there is not perhaps the most commercially wise you know, situation to be in. Yeah? Because you don't necessarily want to share all of that information that you've put in there. But if you use something that's within that that's licensed under the Nefero GPL, that's effectively potentially what you may have to do. Okay? So that was one of the things to, you know, to look out for in a, in a cloud OpenStack type environment. And you know, there are lots of things out there that are licensed um, with that, that type of license as well. So iText, Mongo, GhostScript, Magento. But what you will see is a lot of those are also available with a commercial license. So you can actually cover yourself okay, by paying for what is effectively an open source component library, but actually buy it as a commercial component, which your obligations are different and they certainly don't include necessarily making your source code available to anybody on the internet. Okay. But although that's, if you like, one concern, you know, the AGPL is a classic concern, particularly for you know, as-a-service vendors, there are other licenses that you need to be aware of, and there are other licenses that you need to look into. So there's a common public attribution license that's AGPL-like, there's open software, and plus, there's just all of the other licenses. You know, there is the you know, non you know, not for commercial use. There are licenses that come into effect based on usage, you know, number of users you have, not how you distribute it. There are the beerware licenses where you know, if you just meet the guy, you just buy him a beer. You know, it's as simple as that, but it's still an obligation, and there are still terms and conditions associated with that as well. Okay. And then, you know, quite apart from those types of licenses, there are a whole host of other as-a-service compliance issues, okay? Images, icons, fonts, sounds, people are really good at noticing those and picking them up when they see them on the internet. That's my picture, that's my font, I took that, okay? What people are not so good is in an engineering development space is remembering, well, why did we bring that picture in? Where did it come from? Did anybody say we could use it? Why could we use it? Did we ever use it? You know, in sitting there in your code base, it's sitting there in application, but people don't really work out why it's there and where it came from. Okay. We talked about JavaScripts and cascading style sheets and HTML and whatever else for you know for web, um, websites. But as I say, the obligations around distribution and what distribution means can come into effect even if you are using those things internally and not just commercially and shipping them as part of a product as well. So if you're you know, enabling a new website internally or intranet, whatever it might be, then there may be obligations if you're using open source components. There's also patent licenses. So you may look at the terms of an open source component and you may say, yeah, I'm meeting all those obligations, I'm happy to meet those obligations, I'm compliant. 
if that open source component then references something like a codec, like an MPEG or something like that, you may still have obligations commercially in terms of licensing that actual codec, okay? which may or may not be covered, or will, probably won't be covered by the terms of the open source component that references it as well. And then if you've got a particularly large customer that goes, I don't trust that cloud, it's, you know, I don't know anything about it, I want it on premise, I want my own version, then obviously that's going to change the type of distribution and that may change the obligation. So you may be compliant, you know, in your OpenStack cloud environment, but if you move that on premise, that may change what you need to do in order to be compliant. It may even invalidate some of those compliance things for the licenses that you've got. Okay. And finally, you've got to remember the zombies. Okay, so the other issue is going to be all of that untracked software, those libraries with vulnerabilities and the old versions that you've got sat in your code base. Okay. So again, what can you do? Okay, well, we've talked about reviewing, scanning, at low levels to confirm compliance with the, um, your policies and also detect the vulnerabilities, and we'll come to policies in a second. Okay. And it's important when you're looking from a compliance point of view to actually look at the declared license and then any associated um, subcomponents as well. Because as I say, you may be compliant with the high level license, but then the subcomponents may have unacceptable licenses. Yeah? Some of these licenses are mutually incompatible. Some of these licenses take precedence over the other you know, from a legal standpoint. So just because you, you're happy with the top level component license, there may be subcomponents that it uses and references you know, that are actually, you know, may not be um, satisfactory for you in a commercial organisation. And then obviously the results from these, again, you know, help you make those use, don't use decisions. It's data, it's information to feed into that process. So you decide whether you're going to carry on using that component, you decide whether you need a new version of that component. Perhaps you rewrite it, perhaps you write your own version or modify it, push it out to the community. Drive that immediate, um, the internal remediation, fix the problems, again, create the bug reports and the streams. Okay. Now, obviously, the biggest issue with this is how do you get people bought into this? Okay. Now, I don't really know any developers like this, but apparently, developers like to ship. Apparently, they often route round processes, especially if it's not clear why that process exists. So I don't really know any developers like that, but you may. So, <laughs> so some of the things you can talk to your organisation about is, you know, why are we even doing this? You know, what's the point? Well, as we talked about, Open source software is not free. There is a degree of obligation, even if that is often more a moral obligation than a financial obligation. Okay. So attribution, you know, we should give credit where credit is due. If you write something good and it's pushed out there and you're benefiting people, then it's nice to be thanked for it. Okay. If you're a developer and you're modifying somebody's code and improving their code, then it's nice to be recognized for that as well. So there's an attribution aspect to that, you know, just being known for the person that did this and developed this and helped the wider community. There's also just the legal audit, you know, process type framework. You know, it's good practice to do some of these things, you know. You may need to do some of these things. You may need to show certain compliance with a QA, you know, gateway process, um, with a development gateway process, with a legal framework or some sort of, you know, regulatory framework, you know, if you want a certain, you know, ISO standard or whatever for your coding, whatever it might be, okay. So you are required to perhaps from your organization's point of view rather than the actual open source community's point of view. Okay. And then there's the quality security aspect, you know, there's the scare stories. It's, do you want to be, you know, the person that potentially exposes your customers to something like struts, something like ghost, something like Heartbleed because of the code that you wrote, you know? Do you want to be responsible, and it's not, you know, an open source example, but it's certainly a topical example, responsible for the next WannaCry style headlines? you know, because of something that you did, okay? And then, you know, part of the open source ethos is, well, if you're gonna give attribution, you need to know where you got that code from, where that application came from, that library, yeah? To be able to then say, well, we either pay the people that did it, or we actually reference them and recognize them for it as well. So those are some of the things you do to get buy-in. And then the key point is that, create a process that works for your organization, okay? Now that might be create a policy, or it might be audit your existing code first and then create a policy based on what you find, okay? But then you'll go through the process of developing new code and as part of that, requesting the use of new open source components. And as part of that, you're gonna need some sort of workflow process. So before I bring them into the code base, how do I get them reviewed by legal? How do I get them reviewed by someone technical to actually make sure they're secure 
okay, and they're not, you know, and they're compliant. Review that, allow you to use it, comply, fix the issues, okay. And then however you do that, because your process may or may not look like that, there may be more steps, less steps, whatever, make it easy, efficient, automated, okay. Make, get people buy in, make it as easy as possible to get them to buy in. And specifically for OpenStack, obviously you can use that sort of process to analyze the materials that you're submitting and also analyze any modules that you get from the wider ecosystem to actually validate before you put them into your application or your stack, you know, the, the IP and the security points as well. Okay. And if you find things you're not, shouldn't be using, obviously you can remove, you can rewrite, you can go and get new open source components. You can even go and contact the author, find out, you know, can you use it? The issue with that is you're potentially going to alert them to your usage. That may open you up to a whole lot of scrutiny that you may or may not be comfortable facing. Okay. So does your software sort of scan everything you got and say, obviously you Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, okay. And the other thing you do is obviously not do anything. You can wait and see. You know, you can just go, ah, be fine, and then you can, you know, be like Hancom and see what happens with the court case with the writers of Ghost Script are currently suing them or whatever, and how many hundreds of millions that, you know, may or may not be settled for. But, you know, it's an option. You can do nothing. <laughs> but remember, okay, I'm not your lawyer. I'm not your programmer, so I can't tell you what to do. Okay, it's entirely up to you. All I can suggest is that you come and talk to us, and we can talk through some of the solutions that we've got. You can send me an email, knock me up on Twitter. Or Flexera website has got some, you know, details about the solution, what it does, how it does it. That's me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. Sorry, a couple of questions. <laughs> Do these things have an expiry? Expiry in terms of? Like patents and copyrights have an expiry. Or even books, for example, have an expiry. Yeah, cool. Um, not so much, really. It's mainly the new versions. Um, I don't, I don't think it's been going long enough because obviously copyright is 75 years or 99 years. So I suppose probably in 99 years' time, if we're still using the same sort of code, you may find people going, well, I can use that for free because the copyright's expired. <laughs> but, you know, if we're still, you know, if we're still here, it could happen eventually, but I would imagine, you know, unlike a book, technology is moving on faster. So. Yeah, pat patents may be different sort of thing, but obviously that's a different type of, you know, that's a, almost an agreed type of license and an agreed type of thing, which the open source stuff is a bit woolly and whatever. Yeah. Okay. Um, are not all the OpenStack uh, projects that are under OpenStack umbrella under the same license? Or I would expect that they all follow the same GPL or Apache, I think it's Apache, but I'm not sure. Is that yeah, not I mean, the case? You may, you may find that, but obviously if you're then using other components in there, so I mean, this is a general thing about open source, I mean, potentially yes, but obviously you need to know that, and you need to know the different versions of that, because obviously those licenses change, you know, from version to version potentially. And also the vulnerabilities, you know, are not covered by the license. So you need to make sure what you've got and what version you've got versus the vulnerability as well. So it's not all about licensing from a compliance point of view. Question for me, was there really a beer license? There is a beer license, yeah. Excellent. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. Okay, question over here. So, so in our situation, we've got you know, an infrastructure. So your software would be used by the people who run the infrastructure? No. For or the, the application? It's scanning the code base. So, so it's, it's more application It's more application. So before you, get anything in, you know, before you get anything in there. So if a new developer comes along, you could actually say, use the software. Yeah, it's like basically it. what it is. It's cleaning up. So there's yeah. two aspects. There's get clean, i.e. do an audit and work out what you've got and what you shouldn't be using. Mm. And then there's a, you know, for a new developer, if you will require a new open source, this is how you get it into the code but base. Uh, most cloud providers sort of just provide infrastructure as a service. Yes. Yeah. So then if you're running stuff on there or you're using components to yeah. build that, yeah. But come and have a stand, we can have a chat about it. So, sure.